My name is John Horgan. I'm a science journalist and a longtime correspondent for uh, Blogging Head, Blogging Heads TV and Meaning of Life TV. And I've got a a uh, my own little podcast called uh, Mind Body Problems, and um, it just means I can talk to people about anything I like. I mean, Mind Body covers pretty much everything. And with me today is a really wonderful guest. Um, Philip Ball, and you go by Phil, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Philip Ball, who's been writing about, um, you're, you know, you're like uh, 10 years younger than I am, but it seems like you've been writing about science forever. It feels um, like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're, you know, you're just incredibly uh, prolific and you've written all these, uh, these great books. And so we're going to get into that and especially into this book, Beyond Weird, which I highly recommend um, for those who are mystified by uh, quantum mechanics. We're going to come back to this. I'm not saying that it will demystify quantum mechanics, but I think it will enrich your befuddlement. That's sort of how I think about uh, um, how your book Worked that's on me. A, that's a pretty good aspiration to enrich your befuddlement. I think I'll I'll aim for that in future. <laughs> right. Okay, but first I have to ask you just just say where are you right now, and what are those wonderful paintings behind you? I'm I'm in London. I'm uh, at my house in London, which is pretty much where I've been for the past eighteen months, and uh, I'm at the bottom of our garden in my wife's studio. So she's a painter, and uh, this is a fantastic space uh, that she uses, and that I occasionally get to use for um, quiet moments like this. It's and it, that's a wonderful black backdrop. Um, it's it's a it's a nice change of pace from the usual bookcase that uh, that intellectuals have behind them for <laughs> for these conversations um so I, I wanted to start by saying that um you and i sort of crossed path i don't think i've ever met you but i'm is that is that right i We've think met, you're right no weirdly i think you're right um but we sort of crossed paths yes. a while ago when we both contributed to this very strange, wonderful book called Within the Stone. Um, and it was actually put together by an old friend of mine named Robert Hutchinson, um, who was working for a publisher named Brown Trout. And he came up with this idea of taking these uh, photographs that have been made of cross sections of various kinds of um, stones, photographs taken by Bill Atkinson, who was one of the original Apple people. Um, and, and then uh, Hutchinson asked this eclectic group of writers to write um, little mini essays to go along with, with uh, with the pictures, and uh, I just want to give a sense of the, you know, what the pictures look like. I, I don't even know what that is, but that, you know, it's a like cross section of a rock, polished, uh, and then um, greatly magnified, and and the images are just otherworldly. And, I had, um, I'd yes. completely forgotten that, John. That's such a great connection. Uh, gosh, that seems a long time ago now. And it was a lovely project to work on because the uh, the, the goal was so open-ended. You know, these pictures were wonderful. They were incredibly evocative. You could see all kinds of things in them. And as I recall, we were told, write what you like. So you could write a little story or a pseudo history. Um, and I think I did both of those things. Um, so, you know, this wasn't the standard kind of science writing, explain what this picture is showing. It was it was completely free for our imaginations, and that was what made it such fun. So yeah, I do remember that. It was it was great great fun. And and this is this was sort of a natural project for you to do. I'm sure that Robert 
picked you because you've written a lot about the connections between science and art. Um, but I just want to I just want to quote you. I was just looking at some of the essays that you wrote for this, and you have one that you wrote. It's for this this image here. That's uh, sodalite. I don't even know what that is. But you probably. Do. Um, and the the first line of your your mini essay is, "The harder we look for simplicity, the further it recedes." It's tempting sometimes to suspect that the universe is mocking us. The harder we look for simplicity, the further it recedes. I just wonder if you still if you still feel that way. <laughs> what did I mean by that? You know, I guess that is quite a nice lead into quantum mechanics in a way, because quantum mechanics is where we ended up in this reductionist attempt to understand the universe by breaking it down to smaller and smaller bits. And you would think that as you do that, the bits must get simpler. You know, we have all this complexity around us. I'm looking out at the garden here, which is full of complexity. The building blocks ought to be simple. And we kind of thought they were for a bit. You know, they're atoms and there are, you know, maybe 92 different varieties at most in nature. So it kind of gets simpler. But then you realize you've got to have a theory like quantum mechanics to describe them. And you can say goodbye to simplicity because understanding what that's about is is incredibly hard so maybe that uh, maybe there was actually something in that after all okay so here's another here's another thing i wanted to ask you about from you know sort of ancient history um you had peter atkins as a professor at oxford is that right yes it is yes okay peter atkins the great chemist who also wrote a lot of the textbooks that probably are still used in chemistry courses around the world. Um, and he was also a popular writer. And um, I had a run in with him in 1997 in England when I was um, on a book tour for my first book, uh, The End of Science. I actually was, um, I debated his then wife, Susan Greenfield, uh, on some kind of you know British television show, and then I hung out with Peter Atkins and Susan afterwards, and we had a bunch of wine and got kind of drunk, and we were talking about um, the meaning of life and the limits of science, and and Peter said that he thinks that science will eventually be able to answer everything, solve every single problem. And I don't know if he if if he said this in his courses or if you've talked about it, but I just wonder about this vision of his of um, complete knowledge. Yeah, well, Peter is very much of that mindset um, that you know the the way to true knowledge that nothing counts as knowledge unless it is scientific knowledge, unless it can be sort of validated in a in a scientific way. And I'm very fond of Peter. I, he was my tutor. In fact, it goes back even further. He interviewed me uh, when I went up to Oxford. I got sent across to Lincoln College from the college I applied to just to see if they might give me a scholarship or something. So I was interviewed by Peter and I didn't know, you know, his his reputation at that stage. Um, and boy, that was tough. And I remember at some stage he asked me a question. It was about the second law of thermodynamics, which, of course, is Peter's big deal. But, you know, I had no knowledge of that either. And I had no knowledge of what the second law was. We barely covered thermodynamics at my school. And, uh, and I remember him at one point sort of pausing and saying, I think perhaps we're assuming too much knowledge here. And uh, that was Peter's way of, do, uh, of doing it. But I, I learned quantum mechanics, first of all, from Peter. And uh, his, his lectures, like his books, were fantastic. They were a model of clarity. So I was incredibly lucky to do that. I also remember the way in which I think at one point he said, 
there are very few, maybe half a dozen people in the world who understand quantum mechanics. And you were very clearly to understand by that, that Peter was one of them. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, um, that was my sort of introduction to, to him, but, uh, no, I've got to know him over the years and he's, you know, a fantastic writer about physics, uh, as well as about chemistry in particular, but also about, you know, aspects of physics, um, including thermodynamics and quantum mechanics in particular. Um, but it, it's very clear that he is. He he is. I kind of think of it as you know an old school of science communication um, that has that. I mean, there are still you know youngsters around today who have that idea, but I think it's rarer. I think there there was an old school of science communication that very much had that idea that um, you know we, we in the end we have to reduce all questions to scientific ones, and if we cannot do that, then they don't count. Um, so I, I found, as I, it sounds like perhaps you did, I found Peter a, a great foil for sparring with that question. Because I think, John, like you, I, I feel that there are some aspects of human experience that it doesn't, we don't even know how to begin to formulate them as scientific problems. And it probably wouldn't help if we found a way of doing so. You know, we have to address them at, at, on a different level. Um, so I certainly feel that that same way, but uh, but Peter is uh, is is a good person to put the the other point of view. Yeah, um, I, I had a, a quote from he has a a book that I think was published by Scientific American, the Scientific American imprint in 1981 called The Creation, and um, and it, it's predicting the end of science as a function of science answering everything and uh, the book ends by saying complete knowledge is just within our grasp and um which is like amazing that's like such a such a such a wonderful ambition um and having talked to atkins and read some of his stuff i suspect that um his belief in the power of science is a byproduct of his loathing for religion is that do you think that's fair to say i think that's an aspect of it yeah um because i think he 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 does well i think he i wonder if it's fair to call it loathing i mean he 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 certainly dismisses it utterly um yeah. But almost, you know, more imperiously than <laughs> I don't think right. he'd even go so far as to call it loathing. I think probably Richard Dawkins has a loathing. It'd be more accurate to describe that as loathing for religion. But perhaps that's because Richard has had more experience of it. You know, he 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 got religion as a young man. And I think often that's the way it goes. That if you were drawn into it and then you 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 know you 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 saw the light as as Richard would would see it, then your reaction to it is is more visceral. Whereas I think for Peter, I have the impression, I may be wrong, I don't know his past, but I have the impression that he's never found anything useful in religion. So it's simply not part of his worldview. Right. Yeah, maybe contempt would be better than loathing. Yes, maybe that's right. Um, So I I had another, we are going to get to your book, uh, but I had another another issue that I wanted to ask you about. I happened to be um, writing a column for Scientific American on consilience, this old idea of Edward Wilson. uh, Let me see, I've got the book here somewhere. Oh, somewhere. Um, I came, know the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 1998. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was, it was sort of related to the idea of science coming up with a theory of everything, which is very much in the air in the, in the 1990s still, it was seen as, as still viable. And Wilson is picturing this sort of dream of certainly the enlightenment um, that all of knowledge would come together into a, a, uh, a consistent, clear worldview. And, um, and Wilson was talking about science basically serving as the foundation of knowledge, but then you'd also have integration with the humanities and the arts. Um, and I feel like I had, you know, I'm, I was 
I knew you we were going to talk and I, and at the same time, I'm, you know, fussing with this column I'm working on. And I thought you're like the person, perfect person to ask about whether this kind of grand unification of knowledge is viable because you've written so much about science and the arts. And I think you also have, you've written plays. I mean, you're sort of, of an artistic bent yourself. Yeah, I've I've written plays and I've uh, published a novel. Um so I'm, you know, absolutely interested in that sphere of, of activity as well. Um I remember I remember that I wrote to Ed Wilson about Concilian. Huh. So I reviewed it for somewhere. I can't for the life of me remember what I said to him, but I do remember that he replied very graciously uh to whatever it was. Um but I from what I recall of that book, you know, it was this grand project of a sort of unified uh system of 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 knowledge. And I guess my view of that is that there are some that there are many areas of human experience that if you try to somehow reduce them to uh you know a system a let alone a scientific system you you lose what it is about them that that really seems to matter to us i mean i wrote a book about uh, about music for example about how the brain makes sense of music uh, the cognition of music uh, what is going on when we do that and i think there were there are definitely things we can say about music that we can put within a kind of scientific context what is happening in the brain um, to trigger the emotions that we have. There are absolutely things that we can say about that, but that will only get you so far. I think that was the conclusion I came to after, you know, really trying to do what I could to review this vast literature of the cognition of music. It wasn't going to give us all the answers to the questions we might want to ask about music. Um, because they they aren't questions that we can necessarily put in that form. Um, I, I've I've just written. I mean, you say, John, about uh, about my book. Actually, the book I've just published is 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 a book called The Modern Myths, and it looks at um, the stories that we've told in modern literature. So over the last three hundred years, really, the earliest one I look at is Robinson Crusoe. The stories that I think have acquired a mythic status. They serve the function that the ancient myths used to serve. And I think that that function, these are stories, so as I say, it's Robinson Crusoe, Frankenstein, Dracula, Jekyll and Hyde, Sherlock Holmes, and a few others. These are stories that I think are, they exist because they look at questions of hu- that we experience through being alive that don't have resolutions, that we can't answer but that we need some way to grapple with. And stories allow us to do that. You know, the story of Frankenstein is often said the story of Frankenstein is about, you know, science going bad, science going wrong, the rogue scientist doing something, you know, hubristic and paying the price for it. So it's almost seen as a cautionary tale about technology. Well, that's one way to read it, but I don't think it's the only way or even the most important way. I think that a lot of what is Frankenstein is about, and you can see why this would be so when you think of Mary Shelley's life, is about parenting and our responsibilities to our offspring. And there are fears around that that don't have a resolution. Fears of what if my child is monstrous? What if my child hates me? What if my child wants to kill me? What if I hate my child and reject it? All of these things are worries that we have that we don't have answers to. So I I don't see how the purposes that literature like that solves will ever be brought into some sort of grand project about knowledge because there aren't answers to be had. There are questions and dilemmas to grapple with, but we will grapple with them in different ways at different times, according to different cultural preoccupations. That's why we need literature and the arts to help us deal with those dilemmas, not to answer some you know, well-specified question of the sort that you can do, that you can address with a laboratory experiment. Wow, that's a really great defense of, of humanities and, and, uh, and the arts and a response to, you know, the whole consilience project, which, by the way, uh, Steven Pinker um, is also part of. I mean, he had a whole section of his recent book, Enlightenment Now, where he's talking about the arts in a in a way that's similar to Wilson's and Pinker also has a real antipathy to 
um, what he calls postmodern scholarship. And I agree that some of it can get silly, but I see the arts and, um, and humanities and especially philosophy as giving this really almost necessary pushback to the tendency of the sciences to um, resolve every question and to uh, end up in some position of certitude on on even really deep questions about uh, human existence. You've got the good artists and the good philosophers coming along and and looking at uh, the state of modern science and saying, okay, this is really impressive, but there's a lot you're leaving out here and it's not details this is something that's fundamental to the human experience um i no i i, I absolutely um agree with that uh, i mean in fact stephen pinker's uh, i called my book on music cognition the music instinct as a little sort of nudge you know uh, in the direction of stephen pinker's fantastic book uh the, the the language instinct um but pinker was also you know he said of music he famously said that it's auditory cheesecake we can understand it as a kind of parasitical phenomenon on our evolutionary um you know adaptive uh, 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 instinct to read things into to, to to deal with sound basically to interpret sounds. Um, so music, you know, rides on the back of those adaptive instincts and does stuff with it. And uh, it's cheesecake in the sense that we don't need it for our culture. It's not essential. Um, it's just kind of nice. Um, and you know, so that's just like cheesecake. Um, and I, I guess one of the things I wanted to suggest in my book is that. Um, even if that's true, we don't know for sure whether music has an intrinsic adaptive potential or whether it is just related to adaptations for other reasons. We don't know which of those is true. But even if we if we resolve that issue, it doesn't tell us about music. It's not going to explain away music. I mean, Stephen isn't wasn't suggesting that exactly. But I think that by calling it auditory cheesecake, he was, uh, uh, amongst other things, he was putting a very particular, very culturally particular interpretation on music because music has so many different functions in different cultures it's not all about you know listening to give us a kind of little spurt of neurotransmitters and enjoyment it does so many other things and i think you know this is the problem in general with these attempts to uh try to sort of scientize the humanities or to sometimes to to kind of portray science as timeless knowledge I think that science absolutely does find reliable truths about the world. But I think that one thing the humanities is sometimes trying to tell science and meeting with a lot of resistance to is you need to step back a little bit and just see that the questions you're answering, uh, you're asking and the kinds of answers that you find that there is going to be a kind of cultural um, uh, specificity to them. Those answers, you know, have changed over time. Probably in 300 years time, the answers we have to a lot of these questions will look quite parochial. Certainly questions perhaps about the mind, perhaps about the universe, too. Um, So I don't think those two things are inconsistent. I think, you know, sometimes uh, people like uh, Stephen Pinker worry that you get into relativism and that, you know, one idea is as good as another. It doesn't have to be that. It just means that we, we need to take care to remember that science is rooted in in culture, uh, rooted in society. And um, that's going to influence the kinds of questions that we ask, and to some degree, the kinds of answers that we find. Okay, that's a great segue to quantum mechanics, what you just said there. Um, so Beyond Weird, it, it's uh, it came out in 2018, and uh, holding it up again. Um, I I read it because uh, I read it now because I'm engaged in this project. It's lasted for a year now to try to understand quantum mechanics better um, by learning a little of the math. This is because all my summer plans a year ago were canceled because of the uh, pandemic. So I've been um, reading uh, reading lots of books and talking to a lot of people about quantum mechanics. And um, 
Let me just ask you as a way of getting into this conversation, why did you decide to write this book? What was your hope for it? <laughs> it, it was it was one of those books, and I think I find this happens to me more and more now. It's one of those books that I didn't sit down and think, hmm, what shall I write next? Maybe let's do a book. On, I mean, if I had done that, I would have been insane to think maybe a book about quantum mechanics. Not only because there are so many books written already about quantum mechanics, but also because it's a subject on which no one agrees, and you're bound to offend people <laughs> somewhere by, by trying to say anything uh, about you know what it means. So it didn't come about like that. It came about um, because I had, for one reason or another, found myself writing a series of articles for various magazines, short articles about different aspects of quantum mechanics. And in the course of doing that, this must have been about six years ago or so now, it start, started to dawn on me that, hang on a minute, the, the way that people like me, people who write about science, the way we have been talking about quantum mechanics all along isn't really right. And in fact, in some ways, it's plain wrong and it's certainly misleading. The ways we describe quantum stuff as being a bit weird, we just talk about super, this, you know, the, this notion of superpositions in quantum mechanics as things being in two states at once or in two places at once. Actually, it's not, that's not the right way to talk about it. We've got the wrong narrative for quantum mechanics. Um, and that doesn't just apply to popular science. I think often that uh, you can see that, too, in the primary literature in quantum mechanics. Um, you know, the way that the, the sort of introductions to quantum mechanics papers talk about the issues, they use that same kind of language. And it's not right. Um, so I felt. I think, to be honest, almost with a sinking heart, oh, God, I've got to write this book about it, haven't I? To try to say, you know, to try to change the record. is So that was really my hope with this book, that uh, I, I would, uh, as, as we used to say, when we actually had to pick up LPs, records, and put them on the deck and play them, you know, change the record. Let's, let, let, let's start talking about quantum mechanics in a different way that better reflects the better understanding that we have about what it means over the past several decades. Because, you know, it's well known that ever since the early days of Bohr and Einstein arguing about it, there have been arguments about qu what quantum mechanics actually tells us mm -hmm. about the universe. Um, but w I think that, we, we, that that argument has advanced that we have, particularly over the past, say, three decades, um, we have been able to refine those questions. We now have better questions. We don't necessarily have the answers, but we have better questions. And partly we do because we have technologies that uh, laser technologies and so forth that are now enable us to do some of the experiments that for Bohr and Einstein were just thought experiments. So I think we do have a better understanding of what, what quantum mechanics is telling us. Let's have a look at that and let's try to say in the light of that, how should we be thinking about this, this you know, fundamental question um, of what quantum mechanics means? Because John, you, you said that you were learning the maths. Um, you know, in a way, the maths is sort of the easy part, you know, which isn't to say that it is easy, and uh, I'm sure you're finding that, but you can do it, and you can get the right answers, and quantum mechanics is fantastic for that. It gives you the right answers, often to incredible precision, and that's why, you know, people have been so happy to just go on using it and not thinking necessarily very deeply about what is this about? What does it mean about the world? Um, so that's really the difficult bit, and that's really what I tried to focus this book on. Um, so since you bring up uh, the mathematics. Um, I'll, I have been struggling. So I, you know, I as soon as I started this project, I I went back and uh, and tried to brush up on calculus, which I had, you know, like forty years ago. Um, and I learned some linear algebra for the very first time. I had to remind myself of what sines and cosines are and um, natural algorithms and, uh, and all that stuff. And um, I must say, I, I've had, uh, for me, the mathematics hasn't really helped with the, some of the philosophical questions, the questions about interpretation and, and uh, the meaning, it's kind of shifted 
the way I look at certain things. Um, but um, I, I, it's it's kind of complicated my um, my view of things rather than um, rather than giving me clarity. So the question I have have for you is: you learn quantum mechanics with the whole mathematical framework when you were studying with Peter Atkins back at Oxford, I, I'm assuming. Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. To what extent does your mathematical knowledge inform the way you look at quantum mechanics now? To what extent is it necessary for your, for your um, appreciation of quantum mechanics and your, your efforts to try to figure out what it really says? Well, uh, to be honest, John, I'm, I'd be probably in pretty much the same boat as you in that regard these days, because th we're talking about, you know, I learned it from Peter, it's almost 40 years ago now. Um, it's certainly been, you know, a good 35 years since I did a quantum mechanical calculation. So I'd have a lot to remind myself about that. I suppose well, at least what I do have in the back of my mind is I could do this stuff once. So I know it's possible, but I don't think it does help. Um, and in fact, I think, I mean, there are people who say and have said and have said to me, you can't write a book about quantum mechanics without having some of the maths in there. That's ridiculous. You know, you just can't g convey the essence of it. To my mind, that there are different things. And in fact, I think people have a tendency to hide behind the maths, not just in quantum mechanics, actually in physics in general. You put the maths on the board and you feel sort of, you know, safe showing people the maths. Um when you have to sort of talk about what that is actually representing and what these terms mean and what physically is going on, then it can become a bit harder, particularly if you haven't really clarified that yourself. So I, I would be wary of, uh, you know, taking refuge in the maths as though that is going to explain what is going on. I think, it, it, you know, it can help in some respects, but I don't think it is at all fundamental to getting at these deeper questions of what quantum mechanics means. And that's why in my book, I, um, you know, tried to have no maths whatsoever because I didn't think it was necessary. And in fact, I thought it would get in the way. Um, so um, uh, what, what, what I've tried to do, I mean, really what I've tried to do instead is to get at what the maths seems to be telling us. So, for example, with the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, I learned that and I, and I did remember, I do remember learning this from Peter. I learned that as uh, the fact that if you're um, working with matrices in quantum mechanics, they don't commute. That means the order in which you do mathematical operations is not the same if you do them one thing and then another thing, or if you do them the other way around. You get different results. That is uh, uh, that is simply an aspect of matrix uh, uh, arithmetic. So it's not even specific to quantum mechanics. But because Heisenberg expressed his theory of quantum mechanics in a matrix formulation, he found that this is what happened. That you know you got different results, and and he was trying to sort of figure out you know why is that and what is the difference then, and he found that the difference that you get from p permuting these the, the two terms is a, a certain value, and that the way to understand that is that there is um, there's a kind of margin of uncertainty about the, the result that you will get. And that's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So you can understand it as a property of the mathematics, which is how I learned it. But that doesn't tell you anything about why should the world be like that? Why should there be this enforced imprecision in, in effect, the precision with which we should know these two quantities that we're looking at in our equations? Why can't we know them both exactly? What is it about the world that prevents that? And that is something that isn't the, the math isn't going to tell you why that is. The math is simply going to tell you that that, it, that seems to be the case. And I think that um, one way, at least one way of understanding, I'm not saying this is the definitive, definitive way of understanding it, but one way of understanding that question, and I found some others in quantum mechanics, is to think about, think about it in terms of information. 
what is and isn't allowed by the universe, for whatever reason, what do we find is and isn't allowed in the ways that information can be extracted from physical systems, um, can be manipulated within physical systems. That's why the, the, the modern technology of quantum information, so the thing that's giving us quantum computers, that's why it's not simply an application of quantum mechanics. It's actually the interaction is much more intimate than that between the apply, what looks to be the applied aspect of quantum technologies, quantum information technologies, and the, the, the fundamental theoretical aspects. And that it seems that some of these long-standing problems in quantum, um, in, in the fundamentals of quantum mechanics, what it really means, we can at least formulate them more clearly and perhaps understand them better when we formulate them in terms of the manipulation of information. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I, um, I was going to save this for a little later, but we don't have infinite time here. So I'll, I'll get into, into this um, right now. Uh, I love the way that you um, emphasized, and I think uh, to a certain extent advocated for for looking at um, quantum mechanics within the in, within the framework of uh, information and using information as a as a key concept, let let me tell you why I found it kind of ironic that you did that. It seemed to me that you were intent earlier in your book on um, crushing. Maybe that's too strong. Well, stick with it for now. Crushing the idea that uh, physics needs consciousness, it, it, that mind has to be part of our worldview, that this is a consequence of, uh, of quantum mechanics. This is something that uh, Wigner said. Uh, John Wheeler was famous for the it, for it from bit and the participatory um, universe. John Wheeler was one of my favorite scientists. Uh, Ever, uh, but of course, you know. Then there are people like Deepak Chopra, sort of new age people who have tried to turn quantum mechanics into some form of mystical idealism, where mind is the basis of uh, all reality. And I thought you did a great job of showing that um, this process that's called decoherence can uh, get rid of the mystery of of measurement and the collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics, where you have, uh, you know, the, the equation is looking at an electron and seeing this range of, of possible behaviors. And then uh, we make the measurement and only one of those trajectories um, is actually observed. And so, okay, well, it's because we were looking at it. And so mind is central to, you know, the construction of reality. And you're saying, no, there are these, these sort of straightforward environmental processes, just the, the, you know, the electron interacting with all the other stuff around it that cause, you know, the collapse or whatever you want to call it. Um, you explained that so clearly that I thought you were just, you know, trying to get consciousness out of, out of the picture, it seems to me that information theory brings it back in. Uh, the concept of information doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I, there are people who disagree with me on this, very, you know, physicists and philosophers. But to me, uh, information is, um, it sort of assumes uh, senders and receivers of something of bits or whatever. So I, I'm just sort of throwing this out there and to see if this is something that you'd thought about. Do the, were you trying to get rid of consciousness earlier and are you sort of bringing it back in with, with information? Um, I don't see any role of consciousness in itself in helping us to understand quantum mechanics. Um, 
I, th- I think that's slightly different. Certainly, and I don't see, certainly I don't see any role that quantum effects are playing in our own consciousness, which is you know the other way that sometimes it, it, it's talked about. I see no reason to to assume that it just doesn't seem necessary. Um, I think the way the way it makes sense to me is 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 slightly different. I think from from, from how you put it, that quantum mechanics um, is. It, what we're doing in, in, in science in general is asking questions about the universe and looking for answers in the universe. Um, uh, so we figured, you know, we do that. Uh, we've done that in classical mechanics. We've sort of figured out, you know, we tr- try to understand how does this thing work? And we can ask questions and do experiments and get answers. We figured we could just keep on and on and on doing that at smaller and smaller scales. Um, and it seems that what quantum mechanics is telling us is, well, not necessarily because the the way I make sense of it is this. There's this weird property to the universe, which is we can formulate more questions about it than the universe has the capacity to deliver answers about. They're just simply, it cannot hold enough information to give us all the answers to the questions that we might ask. So it's, only, it's in that sense that, that if you like the observer or the individual appears you know not nothing particularly sort of uh hazy or, or or certainly mystical about consciousness just the fact that we ask questions mm-hmm. um so you know and that question can be we're looking at this quantum bit is it a spin up or is it a spin down that's a simple question it has a yes or no answer it can only have a yes or no answer those are the only two answers that quantum mechanics permits so now you know there are two particles um and we can ask Okay, is that one up or down? Is that one up or down? But we've done something to these two particles. They've been created in such a way that whatever answers we get are correlated. So if one is up, the other has to be down or vice versa. That's that's something that because of the way they were created, that has to be so. Well, there is some information sort of used up, if you like, in ensuring that correlation exists. So asking that and then also thinking that we can independently say, what is this one doing and what is that one doing? There's not enough information in the system to do that. All we can, all the universe can say is, well, it's either going to be that or it's going to be that. OK, um, so, you know, but we can ask more questions than just are they correlated or, or you know, or not. Um, but the universe can't give us those answers. That just seems to be the way the universe is made. That is a rule about information at the fundamental level. So it's that, I think, that, that gives rise to all these things like entanglement. It's, it's, if you like, a limitation of the universe to give us all the answers we, we require. And John Wheeler had a fantastic you know, way of talking about that. He expressed it as a kind of quantum mechanics being a bit like that game of 20 questions where, you know, you're trying to, where with just yes, no answers, you try to figure out what the other person has, uh, has uh, you know, they've chosen a person, a famous figure, and you have to say yes or no. Is it male or female? Are they alive or, or dead? So, you know, these are quantum questions. Yes, with just yes or no answers. Um, but, the way the the uh, the quantum universe plays that game is there was never an answer to begin with. The your, the person you're asking hasn't decided. Oh, it's Richard Feynman, and I'm just going to give the answers accordingly. Uh, the, the, the 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 universe has many possible answers, but as soon as I've asked one question, is it male or female, and I've just and the the questioner has decided to say male, all the other answers that they give subsequently have to be consistent with that. And so by gradually asking more and more questions, you narrow your possibilities down to it has to be a single person. There's only one that fits with all the answers you've given so far. But you've only got to that answer because of the questions you asked. If I'd asked different questions, I would have come to it. You know, the, the, the answer would have been forced to give a different answer. That right. seems to be what the quantum world is like. I love <clears throat> I, I love that metaphor that uh, Wheeler used. That when I was reaching the end of your book, I, you know, I here uh, this is what I do to to books that I'm really enthralled by. I I write I write uh, notes with, with a page with a page. You know, so this way, I, at a glance, I can 
I can see, you know, what you've written about, and then I'm writing my reactions. And so, and I was reaching the end of end of the book, and um, and I said, uh, and you're talking about information, and um, and you know, questions uh, defining to a uh, certain extent answers. And I said, wow, this is just what Wheeler said with his surprise version of twenty questions. And then, like a page later, you were talking about it. So here's what I find fascinating about this and why I do think it's still bringing mind and uh, subjectivity into quantum mechanics more than some people would like. Um, and it's also bringing contingency in. The, the, and I think that, you know, the, the way you just described the 20 versions um, model uh, 20 questions uh version of of uh of the game uh as uh as an analog to to physics it, it it's really powerful but it suggests that it's a very kind of postmodern way of looking at uh, looking at science you could apply it to the whole of science and say that all our knowledge is um contingent on previous knowledge. And you could look at any particular part in the history of science and see that there are these various possibilities, but because we had these methods available and these questions that we were asking, uh, that maybe we were asking just because, because we had certain tools and so forth, it sets science on this, this uh, particular course when it might have gone in all these other possible directions so instead of having this is a very Kuhnian picture of science so Thomas Kuhn often compared uh, the evolution of science to the evolution of of uh, species he said there's no telos there's no absolute truth or ideal organism at the end of this process all you can say is that things keep changing you know they get they just get different in in uh, very various ways so it's almost the opposite of the idea of total knowledge and not the opposite but it's a much more complicated uh picture um looking at science as very much of an, an historical contingent process it's, it reminds me of uh the way stephen gould sometimes talked about science when he was pushing back against against richard dawkins or or you know the people who talked about a theory of everything, um, it's to me it, it here, here's here's sort of the punchline for me. It it raises questions about the inevitability of quantum mechanics as a kind of theory of of the world. The more I learn about, and I think this is what I've gotten from your book in part. The more I learn about the the early history of quantum mechanics. And the more I've learned about the mathematics, the more it seems, and I think you actually said this in your book, jury rigged and kind of kludgy. And um, so I keep thinking about, you know, if you're like a God, this godlike figure, you're looking at the range of mathematical possible models of whatever, uh, physical reality or electrons. Um, Quantum mechanics took this direction, but maybe there are all these other ways that we could have gone that actually might have been more sensible, less prone to uh, paradoxes and contradictions and that sort of thing. I'm sorry, I'm, I just threw a lot at you, but uh, this, <laughs> and this is because you, I found your book so stimulating. It made me, it, it brought up all these ideas in my mind. Well, Fantastic. That's exactly what I wanted. And I, wa and I want to, first of all, to just clarify that actually, I think you're right to say that quantum mechanics seems to introduce some subjectivity to the world and some contingency. I, I think it's un that's unavoidably uh, what it seems to be telling us for this very reason, that the answers we get depend on the questions we decide to ask. We have some say in that. Um, so, you know, in that sense, absolutely, there's a subjectivity to it. Um, but uh, I, I, I nevertheless think, I, I suspect that 
something like quantum, you know, there are more than one way to formulate quantum mechanics. You can do it using the Schrodinger equation. You can do it using Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. It's been shown that the two are kind of equivalent. You can, uh, and people are now trying to reformulate it in terms of rather than equations, uh, in, in terms of statements you can make about what is and isn't allowed with information. And from those statements, they can be very simple statements. And this was what Wheeler was hoping for, that we'd get to, you know, that level of quantum mechanics where we could sort of say in words, you know, what the laws are, if you like, rather than just writing an equation. And from those, it's possible to derive all the familiar things like superpositions and entanglement and the uncertainty principle. That is a project that people are doing and doing successfully. It's um, sometimes called quantum reconstructions. So, you know, there are these various different ways of looking at it. But I think that what all of them seem to be telling us is that in whatever way we formulate it, quantum mechanics is the theory that we humans at this scale of existence need in order to make sense of the world we're presented with. A world that seems, you know, as, as far as we can say, what, what it seems to say is it's a world in which there are certain things that can and can't be done with information. Um, if that's the nature of the world, we're going to need something like quantum mechanics, you know, in, in, in some form or another to describe what we see. So I think that's the kind of, you know, inevitability of it. Um, I mean, I do take your point that that depends, you know, that, that in itself is contingent on the kinds of ways our minds conceptualize the world. I think this idea that any intelligent being on any world is going to have Newtonian physics, I don't buy that. I don't think that necessarily... Uh, all minds will carve up the world in the same way. But for <laughs> minds that work like ours, I think something, uh, some form of quantum mechanics was going to inevitably be the kind of theory that we need. But that's the kind, that's really what it is. It's not a theory that's telling us about the world. It's a theory that is giving us what we need to make sense of the world. And, you know, that, I think, is the, the slightly unusual thing about it, because we're used to scientific theories not referring to that at all. They're just referring to the stuff that's out there and telling us about what that stuff does. But with, with quantum mechanics, it's different. And it's different because in the end, you know, if we have a wave function, what that's telling us about is the probabilities of seeing different outcomes. It's silent about what's causing them, really. It's actually all about the wave function is a machine, if you like, for allowing us to predict the probabilities of the outcomes if we decide to look. And that, so it's, it's really all coming up to the level of what happens if we look, if we ask this question, if we do a measurement, if we do an experiment. It's all about that rather than about what uh, a proton or a photon actually is. It doesn't tell us about that. You know, so um, I think I I think I know how you'll answer this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Uh, but let me preface it by saying that uh, I've been thinking a lot about um, you know my my 1996 six book, The End of Science, lately because of uh, it's like the 25th uh, anniversary um, this month, basically, and uh, and I'm because of this quantum mechanics project I'm involved in, I've, I've become to have serious doubts about my own thesis. Um, I've begun, begun to gravitate toward this view of science as contingent, which I used to reject as much too, uh, much too postmodern. Also, quantum mechanics seems totally unstable. And I, it, I feel as though it's like one giant anomaly you know, I mean, anomalies are those little oddities that supposedly uh, lead to some kind of uh, revolution, like like the discovery of uh, X-rays or radioactivity, and those sorts of things uh, back at the, at the end of the 19th century. Um, so it seems to me that quantum mechanics is, I don't know, is ready to kind of break apart and form something else do you my question for you is 
do you feel like quantum mechanics, whatever, however our knowledge evolves in the future, quantum mechanics will be part of it with this whole set of sort of, you know, peculiar um, paradoxes and all that? What, what I do think is we're not going to get rid of those paradoxes. The quantum, I'm, I, I feel safe in 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 saying that i think the the things that quantum mechanics has shown us about for example non-locality the fact that at the quantum level objects don't have fixed properties that are all kind of located on the object and everything re relevant to that object is here um that's uh that that seems to go away in quantum mechanics there is this weird sort of non-locality to some properties i don't think we're going to get back to a theory where everything is local and precise and has fixed values. Some physicists do think that, and they, I mean, certainly they dearly hope that, because that's the world that we're familiar with. You know, at some level, we sort of instinctively feel there has to be a sort of, um, you know, there, there has to be that sort of realist uh, reality where things have real value, you know, fixed values, definite values all the time, regardless of whether we look or not. But I think that that, that isn't going to happen. I think that the, 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 the weirdness, if you like, that seems to be there uh, in quantum mechanics is going to stay. Um, but quantum mechanics itself isn't a fi the final theory. It can't be because it's not consistent with general relativity. Um, and, you know, we don't know what's going to uh, emerge from trying to marry those two together or whether we'll ever succeed in doing that. Um, but I was kind of uh, pleased, actually, when uh, just last week I was talking to Vlatko Vedral, a uh, uh, guy at um, Oxford who's a he's a quantum physicist and he thinks a lot about quantum fundamentals. And he, you know, was saying the same thing, that uh, at some point, you know, we're going to have to deal with this uh, collision of quantum mechanics and general relativity. And he says he's sure that what's going to emerge is going to be even weirder. It's not going to go in the direction. It's not going to go back to something nice and classical and, you know, intuitively understandable. It's only going to get worse. And that pleases me. I hope that that's the case because, you know, uh, that's really what science wants, right? That we want, we want questions unrolling for as far as we can see. Um, and I think that's, that's likely to be the case. Okay, I've got I've, there are two more things I wanted to cover before uh, before we're done. Um, one is quantum computing. Could I, you have a great chapter on on quantum computing, which I've been talking to people about recently. I wrote a column for Scientific American, and I thought you did a great job of sort of clarifying, sort of cutting through the 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 cliches, the tropes that are used to describe this technology and giving us a sense of, of uh, what's really going on. So, and, and also talking about how, about its potential for theoretical insight as well as, you know, doing cool stuff. Uh, so could quantum computing, do you think lead to, I don't know, some kind of paradigm shift in how we, in how we see uh, quantum mechanics? Well, I think quantum information theory has already done that. That's really the point I was making, you know, thinking about it, thinking about quantum mechanics in those terms of the manipulation of information, which is what computers do, has already helped to, helped to clarify what some of the, the, the questions and the, the problems that we have are really about. Um, I'm not sure that quantum computing, once we, I mean, we have quantum computers already and they work and they do stuff and they're starting to do useful stuff and that is going to get better, although it's not clear that um, it's going to get better quite as quickly as, as you know, it looked a few years ago. Um, I'm not sure that that is going to answer any fundamental questions. Um, but I think it has clarified some already. I mean, I, I, you know, now that you mention it, I recall that that was actually one of the triggers for this book that I was writing about quantum computing. And it, it was often and is still often said, well, quantum computers are faster because they just do all the calculations at once. It, um, it's like, you know, they're massively parallel calculations and then you just sort of somehow collapse it all to the right answer. That's not the right way to do it. That's not the right way to think about it. Um, it's a convenient way. It sort of gives you a rough idea, but actually it's not correct to think about it that way. And the truth is no one actually knows quite why it is that quantum computers do things faster. 
we don't have a, a, an easy intuitive explanation for that. There may not even be a single one. It may be that different t approaches to quantum computing, you know, have different ways of using this resource that quantum mechanics seems to give us for doing stuff with information. They have, maybe they use that resource in different ways. And that's as far as we can get at this stage to explain why quantum mechanics, why quantum computers do better. So, you know, it may be that we, if we sort of get a better understanding of what it is that gives us this quantum speed up, maybe that will tell us something fundamental. But I'm not betting on it. I, and I think, you know, at the moment, it seems clear that we know enough about quantum mechanics to be able to build these things. We know what the problems are about, you know, getting them to be better and bigger and faster. And we have ideas for solving that as an engineering problem. And I think that's what people will be focusing on. So I wouldn't hold my breath for deep insights coming out of actual quantum computers. Right. Um, I mean, just once they get these machines and once they become pretty widely distributed, uh, I would just imagine that um, I hope surprising things happen that we can't even anticipate now. Um, Oh, You'd hope so. Yeah, because, you know, that's that's happened so often with technologies, right, that they end up. I mean, no, you know, no one imagined that computers were being invented. So you and I could sit here and talk to each other. That was that wasn't on the table. So right. I would really hope that that uh, that that will that will occur. And I'd be surprised if it doesn't, given past experience. Um, but, uh, you know, whether that will whether that will lead us deeper into the fundamentals I, I just don't know. Okay, so my uh, my final question, it's it's related to weirdness. Uh, I actually, you know, you sort of say the word weird is over applied to uh, quantum mechanics, and I, I agree with that. That it's kind of used as a in a way to sort of dismiss quantum. Mechanics. It's all weird, and and people don't really go into the details of the weirdness, which is sort of what is really worth learning about and writing about. Um, I've actually tried to define weirdness in a specific way. I see, so weirdness, you know, you say something is weird if it seems unfamiliar and uh, inexplicable uh, compared to other things. I think that I wrote a column for Scientific American a few years ago called The Weirdness of Weirdness, which I'm trying to argue that everything is weird. Everything, um, and I think science has demonstrated this, is weird in the sense of being almost infinitely improbable. Um, you know, especially like us and modern civilization, any individual human is, is um, infinitely improbable. Uh, and that when we see reality, clearly, we should have this overwhelming uh, feeling of awe and puzzlement, like, wow, that is really weird. This is related to a question that I think is at the heart of science, although sometimes it's not sufficiently acknowledged. It's, it's um, whether the universe is necessary in its current form or was somehow arbitrary and um, contingent. It's just an accident. I, the, you know, I've talked to Steven Weinberg and you know, some really smart people about this. Weinberg's hope, at least going back maybe 30 years, was that physics would show us that there is a logical necessity to reality. And it seems to me that um, well, physics obviously hasn't done that. And science, the way I look at it, is going in the other direction, making everything look less and less necessary, more and more contingent and accidental. And it seems to me that quantum mechanics is sort of a major contributor to our sense of the arbitrariness of reality. So I'm just, because I'm just throwing this at you, how do you feel about the 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 possibility of science somehow reducing our feeling of arbitrariness when we contemplate ourselves or contemplate the world. 
Well, I certainly agree that science at the moment is going, and I think, I suspect Stephen Weinberg would, do, would, would agree as well that it's going further away from his dream, you know, that our attempts to get to that, what he once called a final theory, um, at the moment, you know, certainly if you go down the string theory path, you've got, I can't remember how many they have, sort of 50 billion, you know, different final theories to choose from um, and no obvious reason to select between them. Uh, so, you know, the, that, that problem has, has only multiplied. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's often talked about that there are all sorts of aspects to uh, the universe that we're in that it's very hard to find a fundamental explanation for. Um, and, you know, that that's this big question about why it seems that it's fine tuned for us to exist. If things were slightly different, we wouldn't exist. Is that because this is just one universe amongst countless others and we'd only be here to ask that question if it was that particular one or or, or not? You know, that's the other aspect that actually, uh, the you know, theories of, of cosmic inflation seem also to be suggesting that there's no reason to suspect that this universe is unique and that its physical laws are unique, that maybe there are others with. So absolutely, you know, we seem to be further than ever from boiling it down to a logical necessity for the way things are. Um, with quantum mechanics, uh, I mean, you know, that it, it, I think we, we have an interesting aspect of that problem, which is that Strange though quantum mechanics might seem to be, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, it's it could be stranger. It could things could be even more quantum than they are in the sense that these these um, hard to understand correlations that quantum mechanics seems to permit between two objects. Um, you know, even no matter how far apart they are, those correlations could be even stronger. We can formulate, you know, rules where that is so and find no obvious contradiction there. So why is quantum mechanics as weird, if you like, as it is, but not more so? And that's one question I ask in the book as well. And I think possibly finding an answer to that, you know, might tell us something about why it is that we have this particular theory, this particular version of the, the quantum world to wrestle with and not some other um, but I, but the, the the reason that I wanted to push back a bit on on the whole notion of weirdness. I mean, as you say, it's partly that we, it's used to sort of as a rug to sweep things under. Oh, well, it's all a bit weird. It's all a bit strange. You know, we don't think any harder than that. But I also wanted to make the point that actually, you know, often that's used to say there's this everyday world that's classical or that we understand and that's intuitive. And then there's the quantum world that's weird and has these superpositions and entanglement and so on. And that's kind of different. And there are these two realms. And that one of the things I wanted to, to show in the book that it is that we're no longer forced, as Niels Bohr was, to posit, you know, just that fundamental separation between these two worlds. We have a pretty good understanding of how one leads to the other. It's not yet complete, but it's not yet. But it's no longer the mystery that it used to be. And things like decoherence that you talked about are part of the answer. And what they seem to be telling us is that this is exactly what we would predict the world to look like if we started from quantum mechanics. This is simply quantum mechanics at this scale, at the scale of being six foot tall. Um, so there's no need to call that weird. It's, it's just what quantum mechanics does. And we have an increasingly better understanding of why that's so. So I think it's that point that I wanted to make as well. There's no fundamental you know, discontinuity between the classical and the quantum. We're starting to understand how one leads to the other. I sort of hope that um, we don't ever become too comfortable with quantum mechanics. It seems to me that one of the things that I worry about um, when it comes to, to uh, science is that it will give us this kind of smugness that... Um, uh, we have explained everything. I, I remember talking to Marie Gell-Mann, you know, a great physicist uh, back in the 90s and um, quantum mechanics came up and I was talking about the, you know, the weirdness of quantum mechanics. I probably used that word and he goes, what's so weird about quantum mechanics? It just is what it is. So he was, you know, he's so steeped in it that it's, he doesn't see it as particularly uh, puzzling. And 
what I like about quantum mechanics is that it's kind of like a punch in the face. You know, it's just, you think you know what's going on? Think again. You don't have a clue. <laughs> I, I suspect you're quite safe in that, John, because, you, you know, we're no closer to finding any consensus. Um, in fact, again, we're, if anything, we're probably further than ever. You know, it used to be pretty much Einstein against Bohr. And now it seems there are constantly, I mean, someone, you know, famously said that, we only ever get more uh, interpretations or models of quantum mechanics. We never get rid of any. Um, <laughs> you know, they they never go away. They they always have their advocates. So uh, you know, I and I don't see any uh, any end yet to to that process. We're starting to be able to formulate some experiments that might just have some hope of ruling out. Uh, you know, some aspects of some interpretations, if you like, of quantum mechanics. But you, I think you can bet your bottom dollar that if that ever happens, the advocates of those theories will find a way to wriggle out and keep their theory alive. I think it's going to be very, very hard to, you know, actually get rid of any of these theories. Um, so I think you're safe. I think quantum, the, 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 the struggles that we have with quantum mechanics are going to be with us for a long time. They're just so entertaining. I mean, it gives us something to write about. I, and I think this is why, and I think I hope this sort of came across in my book. I didn't want to advocate for any particular theory. I have some that I like more than others, and you probably noticed that, But I, and we all do. But I think that, I mean, this is often my sort of measure of uh, the value of scientific theories in general, that what really matters about them is, is are they productive? You know, it's great that we can sometimes rule some out um, and that's important to be able to do. But while we can't definitively do that, I think we should judge them on that question. Do they give uh, motivation for new experiments, for new ways of thinking about things? And, you know, I have to say, even the interpretation that I don't really don't like about quantum mechanics and many worlds interpretation, um, it has been productive. It has given some people, you know, it gave David Deutsch the uh, the inspiration to think more deeply about quantum computing. And he was a pioneer in the early, you know, theory of quantum computing. So I think that at the moment, while we can't rule these theories out, that's really what we should be asking. Are they productive? And if they are, it's fine to keep them. Right. And productive can just mean stimulating and, um, you know, uh, provoking your imagination to go in directions that it wouldn't have um, otherwise. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, possibly through by that means, you know, giving rise to new technological directions, new experiments you can try that might not answer your original questions, but that give you something else interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we're out of time and uh, you know, we, there, we didn't even cover everything in your book. Uh, so as you, you brought, I'm glad you brought up many worlds at the end, because one of my favorite sections of your book was your brutal takedown of, uh, of many worlds. Um, very clear. And you use some arguments that uh, I think I'm going to borrow from now on to, to show that it's uh, it's a, it's a pretty vacuous, um, a pretty vacuous idea. Uh, although, as you said, it's, you know, it's inspired somebody as brilliant as David Deutsch. Um, but let me just thank you. I'm really glad that uh, you could find the time to talk to me about all this stuff. Oh, thank you, John. It's been great fun. Very nice to do it.